Okay, I think uh, I think we'll I think we'll start. I'd like to welcome uh, everyone uh, everyone that's here. We are at the uh, Masters of Financial Innovation and Technology. We're going to do a little uh, you know we call it an information session, but really we're just going to talk about a topic that is I think near and dear to my heart, but also super important and topical right now. I think we've got a lot of cases of of recently anyways, of why cybersecurity is important, why we need to think about it, why we need to think about it in terms of critical infrastructure, it could be critical financial infrastructure, but just in terms of uh, uh, critical infrastructure in general. Uh, Kara, I don't know if I'm running these slides or if you are, there you go. Oh yeah, so that's me. Uh, it's, um, I, I'm uh, the director of the program. Kara, you sort of see in the background, she's gonna take over at a 1230. She's actually the, the brains behind this operation. She's gonna walk you through the, uh, the steps of the steps of the program. Um, yeah, why don't we get to the, to the real reason we're here, Kara? Yes, here we are, we have, and I'm, I'm happy to, to, to welcome uh, Larry Zelvin. He's a member of the advisory board for the program. Uh, but also extremely knowledgeable, both um, on financial crimes in general, cybersecurity uh, for financial institutions, but also, I would say, more generally. So, Larry, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go through a little bit of your, your, your background. I mean, even the little bit of it is more prestigious than, than most people. Um, so right now, you're the head of the financial crimes unit at, at BMO. Uh, you are responsible for global uh, cybersecurity, fraud, physical security, crisis management, basically everything to do with security uh, at, uh, at BMO. Prior to being at BMO, you were the managing director uh, and the global head of, of cybersecurity at Citigroup, also an extremely large financial institution. You've also held roles in the US government, including, and you know these are also outside of the financial world, super impressive, but the director of national security, cybersecurity and communications Integration Center, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Senior Director for Response National Security Council at the White House, the Director of Homeland Defense Integration Office of the Secretary of Defense uh, at the Pentagon. Uh, you've served as a U.S. Naval Officer and Aviator, so you know how both how to swim and fly. I mean, maybe you don't have to do much swimming in the Navy, but that's how I always imagine it. Uh, for 26 years, and you retired as a captain. You got your Bachelor of Arts from Boston University, your Master's of Arts from the U.S. Naval War College and a Master of Science from the U.S. Defense Intelligence College. Uh, besides all of the formal things, you're a super interesting guy to talk to, super friendly. And with that, I'd like to thank you from my perspective, but also uh, in terms of, um, of all of the students. And why don't I just throw like an opening salvo or an opening question at you is, is uh, what's going on right now in terms of, uh, I'd say your day-to-day, -day, but also your strategy in terms of financial cybersecurity? What is it that, you know, anyone who wants to get into this field or is interested in it, what should we know right this second? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And uh, really appreciate the opportunity <clears throat> that you and Carol afforded to let me talk to you and, and, and the other folks here. Um, you know, look, when you look at cybersecurity, particularly recently, it's very much back in the news. Uh, and it's been in the news now for the last few weeks. And, and then look at peaks and valleys. And right now we're hitting a peak. And the reason we're hitting a peak, uh, because a couple of weeks ago here in the United States, uh, the Colonial uh, Oil Company, Colonial Pipeline, had a ransomware attack. Uh, Colonial is important because it provides pretty much all the fuel east of the Mississippi in the United States. Uh, and they were at a commission for several days. Uh, there were about four U.S. states that were running low, if not ran out of gas. Uh, and you saw that I have some government time uh, in my history and in the government, we call that a problem. Um, you know, when people can't get gas, uh, you know, the president gets upset, the governor gets upset, but more importantly, the citizenry gets upset and they have every reason to be. Um, and interestingly enough is uh, this ransomware attack is one of the few cases where very publicly the, the company paid. Uh, the reason that you're seeing so few payments that particularly in the United States and several other countries, that if this ransom finds to a place in what we call a sanctioned country or a sanctioned organization, sanctioned countries are like North Korea, Iran, uh, which the United Nations and particularly some countries have said, you know what, we don't like what you're doing in certain areas and therefore it's against the law to do business or trade with them. But there's also sanctioned organizations like Hezbollah and uh, Hamas. 
But if that money were to go to those core types of organizations, it's not a civil fine, but it is a criminal fine. So it's a very big deal. A week later or so, uh, there was a company called JBS uh, that impacted both Canada and the United States, a meatpacking company. And here we go again. Um, I will tell you that ransomware attacks happen all the time. Uh, one of the estimates that I saw that I think had some credibility is there's a ransomware attack uh, about every 17 seconds somewhere in the world. I think what you're seeing is, is that they are targeting and having impacts on companies that are having far greater consequences than they had planned or thought. Uh, I think in this case, the criminals, the cyber actor criminals are finding vulnerabilities. They're looking at companies and going, you know what, I can make some money off of them, but they're really not understanding the importance of these companies and the attention they're getting, which is kind of a negative because, and, and I use this to hopefully generate some humor, these folks are actually business people. They're not trying to shut down oil in the United States. They're not trying to shut down meatpacking in Canada, the United States, and Australia and other places. They're just trying to make a buck. So um, it, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. But as I said, there are these attacks are happening all the time, not only to individuals, but small and medium-sized businesses, but they're getting a lot of attention now because it's having such a, a large impact on so many other folks. Yeah, I mean, cert certainly over the last uh, you know couple of weeks, we've really you know some push this ransomware up to the front i mean i guess always behind the scenes you know something like this is going on but it's just never come really come to the fore and then with the pipeline shutting down and then you know the ransomware and then the ransom being paid and i can't remember if it was in the pipeline or if it was in the meatpacking plant but then uh, being paid in bitcoin and then the bitcoin mm -hmm. being seized was it a couple days later in the yes at, at the um was that the is it the the server, wasn't it? At the, I can't remember. What it's it's the Bitcoin wallet. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that was quite, uh, you know, sort of almost cloak and dagger type stuff, right? As you know, we, we, we pay this, we get it back and, and uh, yeah. it's certainly been push, pushed to the fore. Now, how does this apply to, to financial institutions? I mean, there's also an extremely valuable sort of set of, of, of infrastructures that, that financial institutions, A, are a part of and B, operate. What, what should we be paying attention to there? Yeah, look, there's a couple of things. First, you know, when you look at the ransom payments, when you look at Colonial and JBS, I think they, 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 what they paid was upwards of nine, maybe $11 million. And, and look, for companies their size, um, while that's a lot of money, it's, it's also doable. Uh, what's interesting about these ransomware attacks is that the bad actors in a number of cases are going into the company, seeing if the company has cyber insurance, seeing what the limit of that insurance is, and then asking for that amount. So it's fascinating. So from a business decision, if you're a CEO going, okay, my company right now can't do what it needs to do. They're asking me for the amount I'm insured for. Why not? Right? Easy business decision. This is why I have insurance. Well, the why not is it because of a potential criminal penalty. So you have to work with law enforcement, with other government partners to make sure they're okay with it. Because again, you don't want to find out later that it was a shanks country and now all of a sudden you have a criminal violation. Mm -hmm. um, the greatest ransom on record, and, and this is just on record, it could actually be worse, but this is what we know, went against a uh, insurance company, uh, I think, uh, in the Midwest of the United States, but it was a 60 million US dollar ransom request, and they talked them down oh. to 40 million. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so they, so they paid 40 million. So look, these numbers are not insignificant. Uh, the disruptions are not insignificant. Now let's move that over to the financial sector. What happens if you have these ransomware attacks and they're happening at a bank or into the financial infrastructure? Um, many banks move billions, if not trillions of dollars every single day. If that gets disrupted for a day, for two days, for three days, we're talking about massive impacts um, across the economy. Uh, this becomes a national economic and a national security problem depending on where it hits and how long it hits. We can't let that happen. Um, we know about these attacks. We know what it takes to defend against these attacks. There is no such thing as perfect security, but if it were to happen at a financial institution or part of the financial infrastructure, we all better be able to say we did everything reasonable and beyond to defend ourselves. And if it occurs, mm -hmm because we did something that was negligent, that was something that we should have been able to prevent. Well, I'll tell you, um, the individuals responsible for security probably won't be in the industry anymore. 
The CEO will likely no longer be in the industry. And I think you'll see some serious fines, uh, if not withdrawal of banking licenses for the banks that potentially have disrupted the market overall. So it's a huge, huge issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two things popped out in, 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 in what you said. One is with a $40 million payment, this sounds like the business that we should be getting into. So how do we break into the ransomware business? Question one, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. And the other one is, um, it was sort of interesting about the, the insurance angle. You know, they're looking at that. So is, is the response here, I just don't get any insurance, right? If, if someone can't, yeah. you know, I don't have any insurance, people aren't going to hack me because it's going to be too bad or too, yeah. too hard no. to get the, the cash out of me. No worries, Ryan. I'm sure the RCMP who, you know, may look back in this knows you're kidding. Um, so <laughs> I'm well, kidding. International, Interpol and others. That's right. Exactly. You're absolutely kidding. It's going to be um, on YouTube. They don't even have to mine it. It's just going to be. <laughs> <a public. laughs> but unfortunately, a lot of these ransomware attacks are originating in countries where it actually isn't against the law. So it is actually permissible and in some places encouraged as long as that they don't do it on the citizenry in which they already in which they live. Mm -hmm. So that also brings another level of complexity onto this, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talked about uh, paying in Bitcoin. That is the preferred method because it's easier to move money that way, right? There is no regulation. It is par, far more difficult to be traceable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you see the Bitcoin markets fluctuate, do know that, you know, that also affects the bad guys who are also heavily invested into Bitcoin. So a conversation for yet another time. Mm -hmm. um, but look, at the end of the day, ransomware is just one of the many attacks that we're seeing. I mean, you have denial of service attacks. We're using multiple computers to bring down websites. Uh, there have been attacks that have been uh, wiper, uh, like you saw at Sony, uh, at some many energy companies are starting to see this, particularly in the Middle East. Um, but cyber is becoming an instrument of national power. Uh, many countries used to build large armies and large navies, and that's how they would influence the world. Nowadays, all you need to be is connected to the internet and have some really smart folks who know what they're doing. And you can have almost even greater impacts than armies and navies ever could have. So as you look at these issues and, and you know, and who is perpetuating these attacks? Well, they're nation states, there are criminals. Uh, and sometimes the nation states or criminals are working together where they are, uh, where it's to their advantage. Then you have uh, terrorist groups. Uh, then you have uh, folks that are hackers right? Who may be doing it kind of like there was an old movie called War Games with Matthew Broderick, where I just want to hack in and play this game and then, you know, it's NORAD, right? Um, but you also have people for social causes. Uh, they don't like fossil fuel. They don't like the way maybe indigenous people have been treated and they're using cyber to, to make their point and then make their case. And then one of the most concerning of all are, are insiders. Uh, the problem with insiders is, is they are not only difficult to detect, but there has to be a level of trust somewhere. And when that trust is betrayed, that really is a huge issue for security professionals like myself, because um, you, places in the organization, it's essential, but you have to limit that trust and have redundancies and capabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when I was working in risk management, it was a short period of time and we weren't really focused on cyber risk. But one of the, the biggest risks that we had were, were internal, right? This is the time when right. Jérôme Caville at Société Générale managed to keep his password for the old risk management system. And he could then always enter in, you know, he would, he would trade in one direction and then would enter in an offsetting position for a customer that didn't actually exist because, right. uh, and this was, you know, just a really, I would say a simple bit of, of cybersecurity. Someone leaves risk management, moves into front office. They shouldn't have access to that system anymore. And, and you know, this was a massive loss, multiple billions of dollars. So just really simple things uh, and insiders certainly are, uh, certainly are, 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 I think, huge, huge risks. We have one question. I'm going to paraphrase the, the, the sure. question from Patrick. And it kind of goes into one of the topics we've been talking about a lot lately uh, in terms of open banking, where customers own their own data and they manage mm -hmm. the data and they, they provide access to their data to other organizations. Uh, so in a lot of ways, it sounds like a really good way to do things, right? I, I'm the, the keeper of my own data, but then I have to make sure that it's secure, that the institutions that I that I open up my data to uh, are also secure. You know, how, how is this changing how we as individual customers, how we think about data, data management, access and security? Look, it's, uh, you know, data and data security uh, for, for a financial institution is paramount. At the end of the day, banking is about trust. It's about trust. Uh, and if you lose that trust, you're really in deep trouble. 
when we talked about Colonial, when that hack happened, people didn't go, you know what? I don't like Colonial anymore. I'm changing my gas pipeline to someone else, right? <laughs> when you have a hack against the meat processing, you don't go, you know what? I don't trust them with my meat anymore. I'm going to go somewhere else. In the financial sector, it is really easy to take all your money and go somewhere else. It is real easy to go, you know what? I don't want to do business with you anymore because I don't trust you. I'm going to go somewhere else. Trust is essential. That also goes for data. We need to make sure we protect. And look, a few years ago, we weren't talking about ransomware. We were talking about the betrayal of loss of personal identifiable information, right? Mm -hmm. Your name, your tax ID number, your date of birth, all those things that are personal about you. That I course. regret my personal opinion is just you're not seeing a whole lot of those attacks anymore because everything has been compromised 10 times over. Um, why steal it when you already have it? If you go to this place called the dark web, and I encourage you not to do so. Uh, but anyway, you can w go on. Wdarkweb.com. Is that is that it? Uh, no, I'm not going to. Uh, okay. it, it's it's findable, but I I won't be I'm your Google kidding. on this one. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it, it, in and look, it is a it is a market based system. But what used to cost maybe uh you know twenty dollars for record is now pennies on the dollar to get somebody's you know, personal identifiable information. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I will say is, is that we have a responsibility, obviously, as a financial institution to protect our clients and our customers, but our clients and customers need to know that most of the disclosures actually happen on their devices and not on our applications. Mm -hmm. um, it is amazing and it's actually terrifying how much about you is on this thing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be listening to us. It could be taking pictures of us. It knows exactly geographically where we are. Uh, it has all my financial data. It has all my emails, all my text. I could go on and on and on. So we do a, what I think is a very good job of protecting our customers' data, their information, their money. But a lot of the frauds and a lot of disclosures we're seeing are compromises of devices that connect to our apps and to our bank. Uh, and that, what I think is where we have a lot of work yet to do is, is educating folks on what their responsibilities are and what they can do to better protect themselves because bad actors are like water. They'll go to the path of least resistance. So wherever they can get in, that's where they'll go. And unfortunately, many cases, those are the users. Yeah, I'm always surprised at the, the people that you know tell me the kind of information they don't want to release to their doctor or to uh, a medical professional, and then you take a look at the type of information they're releasing to their phone and everyone that's, you know, every single instant that's connected to your phone. I mean, I, I think agree that the phone on its own or mobile devices is the next generation of financial services delivery, but it's also this generation of, of financial services vulnerability. I mean, it's- No, uh, it is. And, and I'll tell you where the, the good thing where people should be more comfortable about financial institutions than anywhere else that they may be, you know, online is, is we are heavily regulated and that's not a bad thing. I, and I'm not supposed to say that, but I just did. Okay. We're heavily regulated. Um, you know, we are constantly being examined in every country we work in. We have internal controls. So there's a lot of oversight on us. As you look at other industries, not so much, Right. And I will tell you that I think most of the information when bad actors are looking to find out about you, they go to social media. It's amazing what people will put about themselves and disclose that can then be used against them to target them. And then one of the problems we have in many occasions is that we'll have bad actors impersonate our clients and they have so much information and so much valid information. It's really hard for us to tell the bad actor from our client. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that, that's uh, just an aside. I keep telling my kids, you know, when you're on Facebook, they're not on Facebook, on Snapchat or whatever. And sometimes yeah. these questions will come up. What's your, what is your first dog's name? What's your grandmother's maiden name? And, and I'm like, you, listen, you do not provide this information to people because this is, you know, this is how you, you recover your password or this is how you get access to something. So people out there, unfortunately, are collecting a database and all sorts of what seems like inane personal information about you in order to impersonate you because, I mean, as the, as the, the lockdown has shown us, you know, almost everyone now does their financial services virtually, right? Even you know, even uh, uh, my, my grandmother, right? She, she's very rarely physically in the branch and can be seen. So she's always got some sort of a technology intermediation. And that's sort of that, that's between the, that's be between the two of us. Um, so what are, 
So take a take a, a step back. So we're individuals. We need to take care of our data. We need to be sure of it. We need to really be paying attention. Financial institutions uh, are extremely are extremely regulated. How do we? How do financial institutions, anyways, get their customers to trust them more? At the same time, uh, keep the systems secure, but not have them extremely expensive. And the reason I'm I'm sort of bringing those three things all together is because I have a theoretical paper on that. And really, what the theoretical paper shows is that you know large monopolists, and I'll say it, I think Canadian financial institutions are quasi monopolists. They have the highest security, but they also have the highest fees for the security. But as customers, we don't actually see the fees for security. They're kind of built into all of the costs of these of these interactions. So how do we, and I'm thinking economically, and I know this is a rather uh, academic question, but how do we convince customers that we're doing the security work, show them the security, and also not really unbundle, but show them what it's costing them to be secure. I think sometimes what customers want is absolute 100% security. And then the answer is, well, if you have absolute 100% security, you can A, either do nothing, or B, it's going to cost you so much that you don't actually want it. So how do we strike the balance between absolute security, having people kind of know what they're paying for security, but not these you know, massive, ma- massive costs? And there's a lot of questions there, but but no, it's okay. And we try and 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 then we start at the top and I'll work my way down. So at the top, look, government in many ways exists to protect its citizenry, right? One of the primary functions of government is to protect its citizens, hence the regulation, hence laws, right? So I think there's an element there. If you look at the number one driver of cost and security, it is maintaining regulatory requirements. So, you know, I have on many occasions go, my gosh, you were building this you're overbuilding this, right? This is costing way too much. And I'm like, okay, got it. But let me show you this law. Let me show you this regulation and let me, right? So that is the biggest driver for security in a financial institution, not in other industries, but it is in our industry. Second, um, I speak to our clients and customers a great deal. I mentioned earlier that I'm going to be speaking to 250 of our clients tomorrow afternoon. They are very interested in this topic. I will tell you, Now, when you get to the ultra high worth, the high net worth clients, um, they have their own expectation on security. So when they go into, let's say, one of our applications or websites, and if they're not finding biometrics, if they're not finding two-factor authentication, if they're going, wait a minute, you did this and you shouldn't have been able to do this because this is not secure, Ryan, let me promise you, we hear about it. Um, (laughs) I'm sure you we. you know, are maintaining their money. We maintain their trust. And if we are not meeting their expectations, they're vocal about it. So that's another driver of client and customer experience will also drive security savings. I'm sorry, security spending. I think it's when you get down to, you know, your average folk and like, you know, somebody who may have just finished university, somebody who just started their first job, somebody who just started retirement. Um, Look, across the spectrum, people are technology savvy, right? It's not like the good old days. And I often tell this story and it it doesn't embarrass my mother, but we got her her first laptop a few years ago. And uh, whenever she got a pop-up, she would close it and go, honey, it's broken. (laughs) You don't hear those stories because I mean, to be online, it's just part of life now. So, you know, I think that some of the bigger challenges we have is just make sure that people are are updating their phones and their apps, um, that they're not clicking on links or attachments that like you was talking about your children, that they're not oversharing information and they're not offering information when they should. So I would say that I think while financial institutions are not perfect, and remember, I always I have said in the beginning, no security is perfect. I think we still have a lot of work to do to help people understand this threat in a credible way. And, and look, they're busy and people trust these things more than they should. We need to educate folks. I think there is a public-private partnership that could be done there to continue to let people know what they should and, and, and need to be aware of. Um, mm-hmm. But those are all my answers. Uh, but I will tell you that if we do not make investments in security, as we talked about Colonial, we talked about JBS, we didn't even talk about some of the other ones like SWIFT and Bangladesh, a $1 billion fraud. Wow. I, I, I'm, a, I'm afraid that if we do not continue to make these investments, the adversaries will, and they don't are not governed by regulation, they're not governed by law, and they're highly incentivized to work together 
uh, and they're highly effective. So either we do it right or we'll have to do it later uh, at, at much higher price. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got two minutes left, but I would still love to hear 30 seconds of details about the, about the SWIFT uh, thing. I, I hadn't heard of it and it's, it's, uh, uh -huh. it's uh, I'm always, I always like a good story, you know? Ah, that's a great story. I encourage you to, to look into it further. So it was the Bank of Bangladesh. I think it was around 2017, 2018. Uh, the perpetrators were North Korea. It was a one billion with a B, a billion dollar attempt in US dollars. Uh, it was caught uh, by folks at the New York Fed because a word was misspelled. And a individual said, you know, I think first it looked like a sanctioned organization. Then they said the word wasn't quite right. And then they started digging into it. Fortunately, uh, the actual fraud losses were only about $800 million. Um, there were other countries had, 1 billion was the largest, but I think you can also look, these uh, North Koreans also hit uh, countries in Ecuador, Vietnam, Chile, uh, Russia. You can go around the world, but yeah, look at uh, SWIFT cyber attacks, SWIFT frauds and Bank of Bangladesh in particular. And I think you will find it to be quite, quite interesting. Great, great. Uh, well, I mean, not great. It's interesting anyway. It's not great that yeah. uh, this kind of stuff is happening. I'm not applauding them. Uh, I, you know what, there's one last question and then we'll wrap it up and you can just sure. say yes or no. Uh, we got a question, is there a global collaboration, I, I guess amongst financial institutions or, or countries to address cyber crime or is this like a, you know, local to Canada, local to the United States, local to Europe? No, look, this is not a competitive side of the business. Uh, so financial institutions globally, uh, we really do a, a wonderful job of sharing information and working together on this. Uh, and look, most banks are global, so that's not an issue. I think the issue is more, sorry to go back to a governmental, in that some of the sharing we need to do and would like to do, uh, we don't have the legal authorities to do so. Uh, and that's a shame. Uh, and I think there is more work to be done about educating parliamentarians uh, about this risk and some of the things that they could do to help us uh, protect their citizens and our customers and clients. But there's organizations globally, something called the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, FSISAC. The name is horrible, but the world, but the group is phenomenal. Thousands of financial institutions globally uh, where we've all agreed to share information uh, and, and help each other against this threat. Great. Okay. Well, it's uh, it, you know it's good it's good to know that they're not competitive in that area. I think it's uh, good. Kara's flipped on her her camera. That's like in the old days. You know, you're getting the hook <laughs> on the stage. We're we're you know exiting stage left. Uh, Larry, it's been great. I know it was really quick, but I I, I think we covered a lot of ground in in 30 minutes. Uh, I thank you. I know everyone that was listening. I will also thank you, and I look forward to seeing you. I think on Friday for our uh, yes. advisory board meeting. And so Great. thank you very much, Larry. Thank, thank you, Ryan, Larry. Yep. That was and wonderful. Best of luck and appreciate everybody's time. Take care. Thanks, Larry. Bye. 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 Okay, I'm now going to share my screen. Thank you, Ryan. Bye, Kara. Bye, everyone. Bye. Enjoy. Okay, we're sharing. There we go. So thanks, everyone. And thanks to Larry and Ryan for hosting that um, fantastic discussion. I hope you uh, learned something from it. And uh and uh, you know we can try to have Larry come back again um, and go a little deeper because I know in 30 minutes it's a lot to cover. Um, but now I'm going to spend the rest of our time together um, going over the program details um, that Ryan mentioned that we would cover for the the second half of this the second half of this uh, presentation. So I wanted to start by sharing with you that Smith School of Business at Queen's University is has been around for actually over 100 years, um, establishing the first undergraduate business degree in Canada. So on the left there is a picture of Goods Hall, which is home to Smith uh, School of Business in Kingston. And on the right is uh, home to our Smith Toronto location. This MFIT program is based out of uh, Smith Toronto, but we will have an opportunity uh, come the summer months to visit uh, Goods Hall in, uh, in Kingston. I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Kara McCreary. I'm the assistant director of this new Master of Financial Innovation Technology program. And I'll be your main point of contact um, when in the program from onboarding all the way until your convocation. And I work closely with Ryan on all facets of the program. So as you may know, uh, this program is the first of its kind. Um, so 
nothing like this yet in Canada and uh, I think in North America as well. Um, I'll go into why this program was involved. I'm sorry, I also just wanted to mention that I'm actually joined by my colleague Jennifer Mayer and she's the application advisor for the MFIT program. So um, closer to the end, we'll have uh, uh, Jen Jennifer go through a few of the details about your application and admission process because I'm sure many of you are also here today to find out more about that. So stay tuned and we'll leave time for questions at the end as well. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll try to get to them. But as I said, I will definitely leave time at the end before we finish at one. Uh, so, um, so you might be wondering why was the program created? Why did this program um, go to market? And to highlight uh, the gap that this program is aimed at solving, um, I have a testimonial here from the CEO of McKinsey & Co. And they said, I have lots of people who speak the language of business and I have no problem finding software engineers who speak the language of technology, but I can't find translators who speak both languages. So given this gap in the market, um, MFIT program was created and launched um, just last, it was launched last August and we had our first inaugural class start in November. Um, so, you know, the MFIT program is aimed at solving this consistent refrain. That was an, just one example uh, previously, but we hear this from a lot of our advisory board members and from industry experts that employers are looking for experts with an understanding of the financial fundamentals, but also with the skills that they need in data science and machine learning. And as it says on the slide here, with the rapid advance of fintech, blockchain, automated investing, and digital capital markets, the demand only continues to grow. So this Smith MFIT program is aimed at solving and filling those skills gaps felt in the, uh, in the workplace and the industry. And I'll just share um, a quick testimonial from one of our other advisory board members. Her name is Jennifer Reynolds, and she's the president and CEO of Toronto Finance International. And I think this does a good job of highlighting how the MFIT program is aimed at solving this gap in the marketplace. So Jennifer says, the pace of technological change in the financial services industry has never been greater. As a result, the need for talent that can help accelerate innovation is critical to the success of, uh, to the success of every organization. The Smith MFIT program is designed to build the pipeline of skilled talent to fill these jobs, which will drive the success of the sector and its critical, critical contribution to the Canadian economy. So now just to get into um, the, the foundations of the program a little bit. So I'm going to share with you um, kind of three layers here. So the first layer, um, the first foundation that the program is based off of is the data science layer. And so just kind of give you insight into what you'll learn under the data science umbrella. Um, this is where you will learn how to deal with the data. So how to collect it, process it, analyze it, visualize it understand it and, and ultimately present it uh, to your senior leadership team um, to be able to tell a story with it. That's really important. It's one thing to capture it and, and grab it, but how do you tell that story and how do you get buy-in and influence from senior leaders? So you'll learn that in this program. The second layer is the analytics, uh, the, sorry, the analytics layer is the machine learning layer. And this is where you will learn how to take the data and to make decisions with it. You'll learn how you can automate a decision-making process, how you can understand which factors or variables are driving decisions and the outcomes that we see. And finally, we apply these learnings to financial technology, which encompasses many things as you can imagine, anywhere, anything from delivering financial services in a new way to paying for things in a new way and everything in between that essentially is a financial process that we're using technology to solve. Some of the questions that you'll be able to answer um, when taking the program with data science is um, where can we invest our money or how can we lend to someone profitably, just as an example. The financial analysis component will help you answer what were the risks and what were the returns that we did with the investing and lending that we did. The machine learning component will help us to speed up or automate that process of figuring out where we will invest or lend, um, understanding the risks and returns, and the machine learning layer helps us to do this better, cheaper, and or faster. And finally, the FinTech component is aimed at answering for us, where will we bring all the learnings together with automated and technology supported decision-making? So as you're certainly starting to see, the program is about 
technology and finance, not just one or the other, but certainly the combination of the two, which as we you know, just shared a moment ago, is a real huge demand in the marketplace that uh, the EMFIT program is aimed at solving. So I'll also just share um, more about the technology and finance component, how in the curriculum, you're gonna learn how data science and machine learning tools and methodologies work. Um, and how they're applied to a myriad of uh, subjects. So those technologies could include, and this is not an exhaustive list, but how the technologies apply to loan pricing, derivative trading, hedging and pricing, risk management, asset management, valuation, prediction of macroeconomic trends, and, and more. The curriculum will cover both theory and practical application. So you'll, of course, learn the fundamental mathematical and statistical theories um, quite early on in the program, actually. But you'll also learn them with the practitioner focus in technology. You'll learn financial theory and how to apply it to real world decision making, and you'll understand the economic impact of that decision. You'll also develop power skills. So in all of your classes, you're going to be, you know, calling on your, your strategy skills, perfecting your innovation, entrepreneurship skills, um, entrepreneurship uh, skills as well, um, you know, creating businesses outside of the organization. Teamwork is a very big one. You'll be in program teams from the beginning of the program that you'll stay in until the very end of the program. And uh, of course, business acumen, presentation skills, analytic capabilities, leadership and communication skills. And your evaluations will um, you know, vary course by course, but essentially you'll be looking at, uh, I think a couple of our courses have exams as a final cumul cumulative uh, assignment. Um, you'll have assignments both individual and team-based in most every course, and you'll have presentations. So you'll, you'll find that that will vary course by course. And so our curriculum, so I've, I've put up here the actual courses that are in the program, and these are on our website, so I won't spend too much time here, um, but I wanted to just explain how they are broken down, because um, that, that's not quite on our website. Um, but the course descriptions are on the website if you'd like to take a look further. So they can be divided into three different buckets, and the first bucket are the technical courses. So these are the brand new technical courses, um, you know, ever evolving content, likely not a, a textbook written on the subject, so to speak, because they're very new and, and as I say, ever evolving. So those are our um, MFIT courses, we'll call them, and those are our technical courses. And then middle are analytics courses. And these are the courses that um, are the data science and machine learning courses that we are actually going to be taking with the master of management and, and analytics students. So we'll be in a, a classroom with what we refer to as our MMA and MMAI students, which is the artificial intelligence program. And then on the right are our financial courses. So those are our core financial fundamental courses that we'll take throughout the year together. And similar to the analytics courses, we'll be taking these courses with the Master of Finance students. So we'll be learning alongside those MFIN students and uh, learning from that faculty. And, and so that's kind of how the program is built and, and the structure, really. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the Master of Management Analytics program, which is where our analytics courses come from, was awarded the 2020 UPS George D. Smith Prize, which is an award that recognizes excellence in preparing students to become practitioners of operations, research, and analytics. So, you know, we're among great company um, by being, um, by having our students uh, share courses in these programs. Um, these are the programming languages uh, and tools that you'll be learning in the program. Again, I don't believe this is exhaustive. There are some other ones that you um, will be able to learn either outside of the program or, uh, you know, faculty member might touch on something else outside of here. But these are the core uh, hero programming languages and tools you'll be learning. We have these additional workshops um, where you can go deeper on any of these programming languages than you know, as, as much as you'd like, um, but then as of course they'll be covered and um, you'll be learning them in the curriculum as well. So the program structure and schedule, I'm sure that everyone's kind of wondering um, timelines and in the state of the pandemic, et cetera, what, what that looks like. So I'd love to just um, share a little bit of information there. So the program for our next intake is starting this November um, and it will run for about 14 months concluding in December of next year, December 2022. We'll have two residential sessions, which I will speak to on the next slide a little bit more. 
And outside of those residential sessions, essentially the program schedule are weeknights and weekends um, throughout from our Smith Toronto location, that downtown Toronto location that, that we showed you a picture of at the beginning. Um, they could be anywhere from Mondays to Thursdays and uh, Saturdays or Sundays, but uh, usually alternating weekends and not a Saturday and a Sunday. So, you know, you're not overloaded. Um, the most you'll ever have is possibly uh, anywhere from one to three classes a week and three would be the max. Uh, they are a mix of asynchronous and synchronous classes, meaning sometimes you'll be able to do watching some of the videos or lectures online or, um, you know, uh, doing some of the materials and completing the course sometimes uh, asynchronously on your own time. Uh, most will be synchronous as well, but I want to just mention that. And as I promised, the residential sessions, just to shed a little bit of light on the residential sessions, we will have two in this program. And so we'll have one right off the top in November, which we will call, we call our opening residential session. And that will be based out of Smith, Toronto. So as of now, we are looking good to be in person for November based out of Smith, Toronto. And so we'll get together for a week long session, which will require about a week, weeks of time off of work. Um, that's where you will immerse yourself as a full-time student. It will be very reminiscent from your undergraduate days. Um, you'll be taking courses, doing team building activities, networking activities, um, a really jam-packed week. So that will be our opening residential session in November. And then following in June uh, of 2022 for this next intake, we will actually go to Goods Hall, which is pictured here on the left. So that's in Kingston, Ontario. So that's where we will have, um, you know, everyone travel to Kingston and, you know, spend a week there together, um, excuse me, with accommodations. And you'll get to see the city of Kingston, which, uh, which is exciting. Our faculty uh, is really, they, they are amazing. And I've only selected four here to just uh, show you a sample, but uh, I believe we have 15, uh, we have 15 courses and I think 12 uh, faculty. Um, and they are world-class management educators in technology, finance, analytics, and AI. There are also industry specialists and practitioners who teach from real market experience. So you'll have some more with an uh, academic background and some from, you know, uh, still working in, in the corporate um, sector as well. Our advisory board, I won't spend too much time here, but uh, these are all listed on our, our website, these folks. And there's 17 uh, really strong wonderful, wonderfully generous um, advisory board members. And uh, it's split over two slides here. So I'll just uh, show you here. Uh, Larry Zelvin, he was the one who joined us earlier today. So thank you, Larry. And uh, we're actually meeting with everyone uh, this Friday virtually. So this Friday, we'll have our uh, advisory board meeting where, we're, where we will check in. And um, a lot of them are assisting us with uh, networking opportunities and activities for the students as well as uh, incoming students as well, like you saw with Larry today. So they're a wonderful resource and Ryan and I are really looking forward to, you know, leveraging their insights and uh, making sure that uh, we're always staying current on industry trends um, that uh, from, from their real world market experience. Career management framework. So um, this is our career advancement center that you will, as a student, get to, um, get to take part in, of course. And so um, they're known as our, uh, we have them split into kind of uh, coaches and uh, corporate partners. And so how it will work, it's split into three um, buckets here. So at the very beginning of the program, you will be introduced to your coaches, your career coaches, and they're gonna help you um, with career coaching. You can book them for one-on-ones. They will help you get your resume ready following a very specific template that gets shared with our corporate partners and recruiters. Um, and then throughout the program, they'll help you build your brand. So there's, they're going to run a lot of different information sessions and seminars, um, help you with mock interviews, helping build your personal brand, um, networking with corporate partners, uh, going to recruiting events, um, helping you with your communication skills. And finally, they're going to help you launch. So whether that's finding a new opportunity outside of your organization, moving internally in your organization, um, they'll even help you with offer negotiation um, and onboarding into your, uh, into your new role. And you also have access to them uh, for a few months following the program as well as, a, as an alumni. So that's a fantastic resource. Um, they're shared among all of our programs and uh, 
I know that students are always really excited about the, the service they get from our Career Advancement Center. And then I just wanted to share with you, you may have seen in an email uh, recently about re reminding you about this event, um, that MFIT was just very recently recognized by the Vector Institute. So we're a new program and uh, you know, one of the first orders of business was to uh, submit our curriculum to the Vector Institute um, to get uh, accredited. And so the MFIT program has been reviewed by the Vector Institute faculty and industry, industry representatives and it's recognized by the Victor Institute as delivering a curriculum that equips its graduates with the skills and competencies sought by industry as a complementary program in business. So what that means for uh, current students and incoming students is that, uh, well, certainly for future, future incoming students, I will add, there are Vector scholarships that MFIT students will now be um, eligible for. There is a... Uh, pretty rigorous criteria for scholarships um, from the Vector Institute. Um, but I just wanted to mention that the nomination period will actually be January to March of next year. So if anyone was thinking of that, you would need to be coming in for November 2022. So not this next intake, but the following. But that's not the only thing that the Vector Institute provides. So in case you're looking at coming this November, I wanted to share with you that You'll have access to, and you know, there's a lot of detail on this slide, but I encourage you to go to Vector's website and find out more about them. Uh, both our MMA, our GMMA, and our MMAI program are all recognized by this institute. And they will provide networking opportunities, uh, events, uh, events more targeted towards uh, career and career focused workshops. Um, they have a recruitment focused event called the AI Summit and Career Fair. They have internship program as well including both part-time and full-time. Part-time is particularly interesting because if you're an international student, um, you might be able to find an internship that has the, uh, the number of hours that you are allowed to work. Um, and you'll join a, a digital talent hub, which is a curated job board of all the AI career opportunities from internships to full-time. And uh, it's an exclusive uh, job board that you will have access to and many more opportunities. So that was really exciting uh, news that we received recently. Um, our classmates and alumni. So as you can probably imagine, we don't have an MFIT alumni uh, group yet. Um, so they will be graduating this December, our first, our first inaugural class. But what I have done here is I pulled for you um, some stats on the average uh, of a Smith alumni from our Smith Toronto program. So those are our sister programs that we borrow from. So this should give you an idea of the type of people you'll be um, bumping into in the hallways at Smith Toronto. So the average age is 34, average years of work experience is 6.3, 2.5 are the average years of management experience and 35% of the classes are women. We have over 25,000 alumni um, from Smith. So you will be joining a fantastic, um, robust, diverse alumni group um, graduating from this program. Uh, in lieu of having alumni information for MFIT, I wanted to share with you our current class profile. So these will soon, you know, in about six months, be our alumni uh, profile. So we had 19 students start in our inaugural MFIT year in November. The average age was 33. The average years of work experience was nine years. We were about a quarter female. Um, we are working to improve that, uh, not just at Smith, but also at M in the MFIT program as well. We had two international students and there are the, th those are the citizenships and industries represented by our class. So really diverse, dynamic group um, from, with lots of different experience. And that's really what we're looking for so that uh, everyone can learn from each other. Uh, the program fees, these are also listed on our website, but I will touch on those quickly. So the a domestic fee paying student is paying $44,440. An international fee paying student would be paying 76,705 Canadian dollars. And I will mention that these fees include your uh, tuition, of course, but also your books and learning materials, um, software licenses, and certainly your meals and accommodation for our June residential session in Kingston. Um, but they won't cover your accommodation uh, in Toronto for our opening session in November. The thought there is that you will be uh, attending classes throughout the year from our Toronto location. And so uh, we'll you know, hopefully be able to, of course, uh, get there um, with, without needing accommodation. And also in terms of the payment structure, 
there's a $2,000 deposit that you would pay uh, after receiving an offer to hold your spot in the program. And then there's three uh, installments of payments throughout the year. So it's broken into more digestible uh, payments with the first one taking place on November 1st. Um, and all of those details are on our website as well. I'd now love to introduce you to, as I promised, to Jennifer Mayer. She's our application advisor. And uh, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, but I'll have Jennifer just walk you through the admissions process. Um, and if you have, as I say, any questions, pop them into the chat. We'll also give you an email address you can email with specific questions as well. Great. Thanks, Kara. Um, so yes, I'm the application advisor for the MFIT program. So typically what we do is we start with a, uh, completing a preliminary assessment, which is just simply a review of your most recent resume and a copy of your unofficial transcripts, if you have them on hand. So, um, and also during this, the, the preliminary assessment, you know, it's a great time for us to either schedule a Zoom or uh, a phone call, and we can sort of discuss at that point in time, your eligibility for the program. Once everything looks great, we continue to move forward. I will guide you through the process. Uh, we'll build your application. So, which, um, which includes a cover letter, a couple of references that are electronic, you know, keeping in mind that uh, you will be asking most likely busy professionals uh, to complete these, so they are user friendly. Um, official transcripts, um, there's of course, there's an application form. And then along the way too, if there are, um, you know, any courses or anything like that, that we believe uh, that would help strengthen your application, they will be recommended um, either at this stage or, or after you've had your interview. But uh, my, my role essentially is to help you present the strongest case to the admissions committee. And so once everything is in, you'll then have an interview with Kara um, via Zoom typically in about 30 minutes in length. They, we do also have um, rolling admissions. So what that means is there's no deadline. We're always working with applicants towards the next start date. But what that means as well is that so far in our this year, uh, recruitment's going extremely well. So, you know, we encourage you to apply as soon as possible because spots are limited. And once once they are full, we just simply start working towards the next start date. Um, so again, even if you're looking just to have a conversation um, and you're not sure if you even want to apply you're more than welcome to reach out um, to me. Um, here's my email address here. We can have a conversation about the program, your candidacy, um, whatever it is that's on your mind or any barriers that there may be, I'm happy to have a conversation. I'll pass it back to Kara. Thank you, Jen. That was great. Um, as Jen mentioned, yes, uh, recruiting is uh, very strong this year. Of course, we have a, a you know, more than a year uh, before from when one, one cohort um, started and the next one starts. So um, yes, we encourage you to get your applications in uh, sooner than later um, in, order to avoid, in order to get on into this November's intake. Otherwise, like Jennifer mentioned, we'll be looking for next November. Um, so I'll just leave this slide up for one more moment. So um, grab Jennifer's email address if you have any questions or you wanna just see if, the, if you, you know, if you're thinking about applying, but you don't want to quite um, go there yet, you can just bounce a couple of questions or ideas off Jennifer, um, share a resume with her, get her thoughts. Um, and I'm always happy to chat with uh, interested applicants as well, um, and Ryan as well. So thank you all for joining. I didn't see any questions come in. So again, we usually have a lot of questions specific about everyone's um, candidacy for their uh, for their specific uh, background. Uh, those questions would be best um, going to Jennifer. So please let her know. And thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate you all coming. I know the summer holidays are close, so I hope this was uh, helpful and informative. And thank you to Ryan, Larry, and Jennifer for joining us today. Have a great day, everyone.